All right, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pacific Northwest Clean Water Association Continuing Education Series. Uh, we have an exciting presentation today um, with Neil Saul Rand on aeration energy audits. Uh, we'll hang out for another minute or so and let folks trickle in, and then uh, we'll do some housekeeping items, introductions, and then get started with the presentation. Thank you. All right, so we'll get started here. So uh, again, welcome to the uh, continuing education series hosted by PNCWA. So uh, starting off, there's a reminder that in order to earn CEUs for this presentation, you must be in attendance for the full hour. And we have uh, a monitor that will be checking attendance before at the beginning and the end of the presentation to ensure you are actually present for the full hour. Um, if anybody has questions during the presentation, um, or afterwards, please feel free to post them in the Q&A box. So if you go to the bottom of your screen with your cursor, uh, a little taskbar will show up and there's an option there for Q&A. Please post questions there. I'll be monitoring that during the presentation. And then we'll also have a few minutes at the end of the presentation for um, people to ask questions then. Um, so PNCWA will follow up with CEU information in the next day or two, as well as contact information for today's speaker. So if you don't see that right away, hang tight and we will uh, be in communication with the CEU information. And with that, I'll give an introduction to our presenter today. So today we have a presentation uh, by George Hubbard with Ingersoll Rand. George is a regional sales manager and has over 35 years of experience as an OEM in the industrial and municipal industries. Specifically, George, George's experience over the last 20 years has been in helping customers design solutions with either positive displacement, lobe or screw, or centrifugal multi-stage or high-speed single-stage blowers, as well as operations, controls, and process recommendations. So with that, I'll hand the presentation over to George and uh, thank you for being here today. Okay, thank you, Casey. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And uh, I'm, I'm pleased that uh, you took a part of your day uh, here uh, for this presentation. So I thank you for that. Um, as, as Casey mentioned, I'm with Ingersoll Rand um, and this presentation will discuss energy audits. And I um, did a lot of thinking about what we would discuss here. And I didn't want this to be a, here's how to do an energy audit and here's how we do an energy audit, but rather I wanted to discuss why somebody would want to do an energy audit. Uh, when you think about it, there are a lot of blower technologies out there. There's positive displacement low blowers, positive displacement screw blowers, multi-stage centrifugal, uh, high-speed single impeller turbo blowers, which could be airfoil bearing or mag bearing. And then there's also the integrated gear single stage high speed blowers. Um, at Ingersoll Rand, we have all of those technologies other than the integrated gear. And when I was thinking about this presentation, I realized that um, you know we can offer a, 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 an energy audit service. Uh, this is not what the presentation is about, but I mentioned that because most of the times when we do an energy audit, it's around an older technology. And specifically, this presentation will center around multi-state centrifugal. So what I wanted to do is discuss um, basically how a multi-state centrifugal operates and then some of the reasons why um, you may want to take a look at an energy audit for this. So when you take a look at, uh, if we take a look at specifically at multi-stage, um, this is about a hundred year old technology and, and it's proven to have high reliability, long life cycle. These will run for decades. Uh, moderate maintenance in that there's usually oil or, or grease and then there's inlet filters, um, but it has a pretty low total cost of ownership. 
one of the cons of multi-stage is, um, and if, if you are a site or an engineer that has worked with turbos before and you've seen this, where there is a perceived um, um, lack of um, energy efficiency with the multi-stages. So um, over on the right side is a picture of a high-speed, uh, this is a, an airfoil high-speed turbo blower. There's also magnetic bearing turbo blowers. Some of the pros uh, for that technology is that it uh, has higher energy efficiency, smaller footprint, uh, very low maintenance because it's oil-free. Um, there is no need to oil or grease the bearings. It's basically just uh, filter maintenance. And the total cost of ownership is, is low on this. But some of the drawbacks of the turbos that we've seen over the last, say, 15 years that they've been in existence is there's a higher initial cost and there's a sensitivity to the environment. Um, if it's a dusty outdoor installation or if there's humidity or if there's H2S in the um, atmosphere, those are detrimental to a high-speed turbo. So we have been doing some energy audits on the multi-stages. And one interesting point that came up is that when you're about 250 horsepower and larger, the multi-stages have sim similar energy consumption than some of the turbos out there. So that was the reason why we started offering energy audits to, to kind of spotlight that to the industry. So why would you want to do an energy audit? Well, when you take a look at an existing blower installation, I had mentioned before, a lot of the multi-stages go in. Um, they're sized usually for population growth, so they're oversized to begin with, which means that it's not operating at its most efficient point. They usually get installed, and then 20 years later, someone says, why am I spending so much money on my blowers? Well, that's where um, you can step in and you can do an energy audit on that blower. And then based on the results of the energy audit, you can recommend automation, uh, controls, regulation, and you can improve the energy efficiency of your existing blower. You know, the energy audit might also point out that you know, that technology is not salvageable, in which case then you could take a look at some of the more energy efficient technologies, which are the single uh, stage impeller, whether it's integrally geared or, or the, um, the high speed motor, airfoil or mag bearing turbos, or even some of the screw blowers. Um, those are more efficient now too, although they're limited to about 400 horsepower, so they're usually in the smaller application. So that this is basically the cycle that um, I, that the uh, industry is starting to adopt. It's, it's taking a look at your existing equipment, um, auditing it, optimizing it, and then going back and, and monitoring and maintaining it. So there's always this um, <coughs> excuse me, um, energy efficiency cycle, if you will. Today's challenges, you've probably seen many presentations, so I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but what most of the presentations will point out is that in a typical wastewater plant, somewhere between 50 and 70%, depending on the study, of the energy consumed at that site is just in the aeration blowers. So that is one of the reasons why there has been such a focus on the blowers in these uh, uh, municipal uh, or even industrial wastewater sites because you can do all the light bulb changes you want in some of the other things, but if you don't address your blowers, that's where most of your savings will come from. So usually an energy audit will take a look at the power consumption and make recommendations, whether you can salvage the old one or recommend the new one, but it will also look at the efficiency of the operation of the plant. And we'll talk a little bit about that as we go into it. This is a little blurb, which I thought was interesting. Uh, in 2015, there was about 25 billion kW hours of energy that was used uh, just for wastewater treatment in the United States. And if we took a conservative number, you know, the last slide said 60%, but if we say 50% of that goes towards aeration, that's 12 and a half billion kW hours per year at a nominal rate of eight cents. That's about a billion dollars a year that goes into aerating uh, your basins. And typically, what an energy audit should be able to do for you is, is highlight 20% energy savings um, in the blowers themselves. So that's about $200 million per year that, that's out there and available. 
So in order to talk further about this, I don't want to turn this into a blower 101, but I do want to focus on the older technology of the multiple stage. And I want to talk about some of the ways that flow control has progressed over the years. So there are multiple ways to control the, uh, the flow in a multi-stage centrifugal. There's manual inlet valve throttling. And like I said before, this technology is 100 years old. If you take a look at some old plants, you'll have uh, a manual inlet valve. And basically all that is, um, is uh, a butterfly valve on the inlet of a blower. And it typically has a chain wheel operator or, uh, or just a lever with a notch plate. Um, one of the reasons why this is, I mean, this will give you flow control, but it's not a very elegant way to do it because if you have one of these lever actuators with a notch plate on it, there's usually an S and a W written on that notch plate. So the operator will go out twice a year and change the inlet throttle from summer to winter. That's what the S and the W stand for. So um, they, that site could benefit from using an automatic inlet valve throttling, which is one way to save energy, and it's a way to save energy 24 7 and 365. Um, that's all based on the demand, uh, the oxygen demand that you have, but it's also based on ambient temperature. In the summer, the uh, air is less dense. So typically these plants are sized for a certain standard cubic feet per minute of air required at the basin. In the summer, the air is less dense. So you got to speed, you got to open up the inlet valve and, and suck in more air to get that mass flow that's required. And then in the winter, the air is denser. So you would conversely throttle down the valve so you are pulling in less air, but still the same mass flow because of the density of the air. One other way that some sites have, have uh, changed the flow in, at their process is to put a blow off valve in. I don't see this too much. Um, when I do see it, we, we like to have a conversation because that's just wasting energy. You're putting the energy into moving the air and compressing the air and then you're blowing it off the atmosphere. And the best way to do um, uh, uh, flow control on a multi-stage is with speed control, and that would be a VFD. So let's take a look at some of the differences uh, between um, changing flow in one of these blowers. So this is a um, set of curves here showing inlet throttling. The top curve has flow versus pressure, and the bottom curve has flow versus horsepower. So you can see in the summer, we will always size the blower for the summer because that was the, the less dense air. So uh, these blowers are all direct connected to a motor, so they turn at 3,600 RPMs, and it's called multi-stage because it has multiple centrifugal impellers inside of it. Um, conversely, the single stage um, machines like the energy geared and the airfoil turbo and the mag bearing turbo have one single impeller, but that impeller can turn up to 40,000 RPM plus or minus to, to do the same work as a multiple centrifugal impeller blower. So we size the blower for the summer conditions. And then this site, uh, based on the full flow, was 10,000 CFM in the summer. In the, um, in the summer, they wanted to throttle down to 7,000 CFM. That's the dotted green curve. So just by changing the position of the inlet valve, you are restricting the flow into the blower and, then, and thereby changing the flow out to your process. Now in the winter, because the air is denser, if we left this turning at 3,600 RPM with the throttle valve wide open, you'd be running way out to the right here, out around 13, 14,000 CFM. And if you can imagine the horsepower curve here, you know, if we only had, and this would be marginal, but if we only had a 500 horsepower blower installed in the winter, you would overload that motor. So you have to throttle in the winter just to get to the original design point, 10,000 CFM. Uh, and then you can throttle further down to the 7,000 CFM reduced flow. So this is, uh, this kind of gives you the difference between manual and automatic. If you were just doing manual throttling from the summer to the winter, you know, you might go out there in September and you might, you might change, you might change the, um, the position a little bit and you'd be running out in, in the middle here somewhere. And then in the springtime, same thing. So this shows you that if you can put a positioner on that inlet valve, you can always maintain this point of 10,000 CFM because there will be a feedback loop 
you'll be measuring BO or you'll be doing something like that to, to position the inlet valve and, and maintain that flow. With blow-off valve, this is fairly simple, but with a blow-off valve, you can do the same thing where you do the throttling. So in this example, we're throttling from 16,000 down to 12,000 CFM. But if the site says, well, you know, I don't need 12,000 CFM, I need less, and they install a blow-off valve on, you can certainly go to lower air flows because now you have the air getting blown off and less air going into the process, but you've kind of parked yourself at this horsepower rating. You're not saving any energy by blowing off the air. Maybe it helps your process, but you're not saving any, any energy doing that. So the other way to do it, the best way, usually I'll say the best way, is to do speed control. Uh, with, a, with a speed control multi-stage, you can take the inlet valve off. Because basically what you're doing here, this is the bottom curve now is flow versus pressure. And the top curve is flow versus horsepower. So if you remember the, the last curve, um, we would size the dark blue line for 3,600 RPM in the summer. And that would give you um, your flow point A based on whatever the back pressure is in the system. And then if you wanted to throttle it, that's the dotted blue line, which takes you from point A to point J. And you can see up here on the horsepower curve, when you go from point A to point J, uh, you are saving some energy. What um, a VFD will do for you is it actually changes the curve. It basically keeps the same profile, but it starts to index it down towards the origin of the axis. So now you could slow this blower down to the point where, um, you know, it, you'd be running at 3,600 RPM here at point A, and then if you wanted to run at point J, you would slow the blower down. And you can see there's even more energy saving by doing speed control here. Now, I say usually save more energy. There are times where it's very close and you have to take a look at uh, the return on the investment because a, an inlet valve with a positioner may be $10,000, whereas a VFD, and I'll go over later, it's not just a VFD, it needs a PLC too. Um, that might be, you know, $100,000. So you got to take a look at how much energy you're saving and how long it'll take to, to pay off that difference in cost. A um, couple of advantages of a VFD is, I mentioned here, you can use it as a soft start. Um, and then um, you can actually control the speed based on the system requirements. That could be header pressure. That could be basin DO. It could be ambient temperature. There's a lot of variables that go into these control systems that allow you to precisely set that blower at a certain speed to get that flow. I'm going to spend two seconds on this slide. It's, it's similar to the slide I showed you before, but it's basically the fan line. 5% reduction in speed is a 15% reduction in horsepower. So that in, in and of itself is the reason why speed control is usually more energy efficient. So here's an example. Up on top, I have unthrottled data. So this blower was sized for 8,000 SCFM and 8 PSI. At that point, it's consuming 343 brake horsepower. Now the site said, I wanna be able to turn down from 8,000 to 6,000 CFM at the same 8 PSI. And we were able to do that with a throttle valve, to take it down to 301 brake horsepower. So you save about 40 horsepower there. But if you did a VFD down to the same 6,000 CFM set point, the power drops, this is a dramatic difference, down to 242 horsepower. So here, uh, extra 59 horsepower. If we use a nominal eight cents, that's $28,000 per year. Um, you know, maybe a, a 400 horsepower low voltage VFD PLC combo is $100,000. So you have four to five year payback on this, which is, pretty good. So there are a couple uh, advantages of using a VFD as well. Um, it's, it's usually the most efficient way to control airflow um, with the lowest power consumption. Uh, one thing I'll talk about in a second here is it minimizes power spikes on startup. Uh, a lot of your sites probably have installed soft starters for that reason. And, and I have an example, which I'll show you in another slide here. But, you can use a VFD and do the same thing by ramping the speed up. 
And then what uh, another really nice feature is that you can operate over synchronous speed. So you can go over 60 Hertz. So now you can increase the turndown capability and increase the flow from the existing blower. So you can go from 72 Hertz down to whatever the minimum um, speed point is. So you can, you can get more turndown capability actually with speed control. Now, I mentioned before, when we do uh, speed control, we need to have a VFD in parallel with a PLC. And this is the reason why. So if, if you take a look at the old way of doing it, this goes back 100 years, you would size a blower for a certain flow and pressure. And then you'd have a corresponding, um, now this is showing amps now instead of horsepower. But what we like to do is we measure amps to protect these blowers. So you have a certain amp point that this uh, blower will be running at when you're at the full flow position. Now, if you wanted to, um, oh, sorry, before I go on, the surge point, and, and I won't get into, that, into any of this here, but it's essentially, if, if you know blowers, you know surge. If you know pumps, it's cavitation. Um, it's very similar. You get to a point of, of higher or rising pressure where you get to the flat part of this curve, and now the, it's a very unstable condition. The flow is going back and forth. And if you can imagine the flow at the discharge going back and forth, that's loading up the impellers. It's putting stress on the bearings because now the shaft is, is vibrating back and forth. And that's a catastrophic failure. If the bearings go, the shaft and the impellers drop, and you have basically aluminum dust on the inside of your blower. So it's imperative that a blower has surge protection. And the way we measure that is we say, okay, we don't want to get to this point. If, if, we, if we get to that point and drop down to the, to the amp curve, this is the surge point. So typically we'll run around 1100 amps. If we get down below 900 amps, that's where we know we need to send a warning to the plant. So in the past, uh, we had, this is what we call a smart meter. It's basically just a digital meter. It gives you two contacts. It gives you a warning and it gives you a shutdown. So that was the way we used to always uh, control these blowers um, to protect from surge. Now, if you, if you take a look at a VFD curve, this is the same point before, and, and this would be the same surge point. But if you're using a VFD, if you remember I told you this, the curve actually indexes down towards the origin, now there's a new surge point. So the surge point here, if we drop down to the amp curve, is going to be here. So there's been horror stories in the past. I think most of these have gone away, but uh, people used to always put VFDs on PD blowers. That was no problem. You had a, you had a pressure relief valve that, that would protect the blower, um, but they didn't realize, you know, they thought, okay, let's take a VFD and put it on a multi-stage too, but they did not realize what was happening here with the surge point. So a lot of old VFD applications, when they didn't have a control panel with it, uh, and they just put a VFD on the blower would run into surge and then they would have a catastrophic failure. So in the old days, they said you can't put a VFD on a, on a multi-stage centrifugal. Well, you can, but um, you need to have a control system that not only has the VFD, but it has a control panel and a PLC that is recalculating the new surge point based on the speed of the blower. So these are all different solutions on how you can vary performance and flow um, through a multi-stage, the older technology that's out there. Now let's take a look uh, at a simple solution. This is the reason why energy audits are, are really beneficial when you take a look at uh, multi-stage centrifugal blowers um, that have basically an inlet throttle valve without a positioner or without speed control. Um, in our case, what we do is we go out for a 24 hour period and we log um, the horsepower and we log the DO. Hopefully the plant can give us their influent data. And this is what the influent looks like over the course of the day. At night it drops in the morning, people get up and flush the toilet and take showers, they go to work and then they come home and, and do the same thing again, run the dishwasher. So this is a typical loading, uh, influent loading that you would see at a site. Now with this example, this blower was running at constant speed and it was sized such that during the peak periods, it would ma maintain two to three milligram per liter DO. So 
in the non-peak periods when the influent was low, you can see we were really over aerating here and the, and the horsepower curve was flat because we were consuming the same horsepower um, throughout that 24 hour period. In this example, um, this utility or this uh, municipality was spending $10,600 per month uh, in their blower energy. So what a, um, an audit will do for you is it'll take this, this data and it will come back and say, okay, we can either put a positioner on that inlet valve or we can uh, speed control. In this example, we looked at speed control. So now what we did was we, we turned the blower down at night and then when the influent rose, and you can actually put some predictive capabilities on this too, so you can get ahead of the influent curve, we would start to speed up the blower and all 24 hours, we maintain somewhere between two to three um, in DO. So in this example, um, just by putting a VFD on the blower, uh, the speed control, there was about a you know, savings of $2,000 a month, which is about 25, uh, excuse me, 20% savings per month on their energy bill just with that blower. So this is why um, so many sites are looking at energy efficiency. And, and if you have some older multi-state centrifugals, the best thing you can probably do is first audit it and see, you know, is it retrofitable? Uh, if not, you can then take a look at some of the um, high-speed turbo uh, technologies that are out there. I mentioned before uh, about motor inrush, so this is basically peak shaving. Um, most people don't do this now because they may have soft starters, but we do hear examples where some people will bring a blower uh, on across the line starter, and they'll have that inrush current. And I don't you might be able to educate me more on this. I, the people I've talked to, um, they get demand charges that, get, that um, get added to their power bill. Sometimes it's just for a few hours after the inrush. Sometimes I've had some people tell me it's been days, weeks, and I think I even had one company tell me it was like for the whole month they got charged um, a penalty for, for that inrush. In this example, it was a $6 um, penalty, which was $5,184. If you put the VFD on, much like a soft starter, you can ramp that up now and you can peak shave it. So now the charge is only $600 and that was a savings about $4,500. So there's multiple advantages of speed control over putting a, a positioner on an inlet throttle valve. Okay, so there are a couple of controls um, that you might have to consider if you're doing a VFD or you're doing a positioner uh, on your inlet throttle valve. Um, this is our example called the MultiGuard. It's basically just a little uh, Allen Bradley MicroLogix PLC. And if you have a VFD existing, um, this can control the VFD. Uh, it can also control the positioner on the inlet throttle valve, depending on, on which way you go. And these are meant to be very flexible. You can send it a DO signal, ambient temperature, um, header pressure. There's lots of different variables that you could that you could send to this little control panel. So that would be any audit that you have. This would probably be some somewhere in the recommendation would be to have some sort of a control process that will control the speed or the uh, inlet throttle to that blower to maximize energy saving. The other example, um, this is the picture I showed before, uh, which is a combination VFD and control panel. So as I mentioned before, if you're going to do speed control, you've got to have a PLC in there that's recalculating the surge points and protecting the blower and the motor. And it's typically you know, it's, there's a low voltage side and then there's a, volt, a high voltage side. So um, this might be one solution that, that you could consider as, as part of your audit or the results of an audit. And then finally, you can go the full, full gamut and do an MDOC system where you can do uh, either automatic inlet valve throttling or speed control on the blowers. You can control the basins, you can have the DO instruments, um, and, and you can tie it all into uh, the master valve oxygen control system. So there's lots of different uh, ways to save energy there at your plant. 
Okay, typically when an energy audit is done, um, it's it's not only looking at energy consumption, but it's looking at how your process is operating and it's also looking at the equipment. Um, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit um, coming up, but typically, you know, why would a site want to do an energy audit? Well, there's a, there's a large number of reasons. The system might have been over-designed. This is the primary reason that we see. Usually, as these plants get designed, they have population growth in mind. So they park a blower at a certain speed to provide a certain amount of air based on an increased loading that's perceived to be in the future. Sometimes we don't realize that population growth, so it could be over-designed. Um, assumptions on plant loading, changes in the process. If you go to, from coarse bubble to fine bubble, you have to address the blowers as well because there's going to be changes in the airflow requirements. Um, some of these are self-explanatory, inefficient, unreliable equipment, large variation in inlet temperatures. I mean, if you're up north um, and, and you get to 100 degrees in the summer and you get below freezing in the winter, that would be a good candidate to take a look to do an energy audit. Um, also, like up in the Northeast, I'm in Philadelphia right now. Um, the Northeast is, is just outrageous with, with some of the um, energy costs that we see up there. I don't know how the rest of the country is, but um, that plus the uh, the penalty charges for the peak inrush uh, currents get to be pretty high. Um, I mentioned before exhausting the atmosphere, uh, and then also um, questions about surge protection. Sometimes as your plant changes, your operating point changes. So now the surge protection needs to be reevaluated because it was originally assumed to be operating at a certain pressure. So typically how is an energy audit conducted? This will vary um, from company to company, but there should be a pre-meeting to assess the current state. Um, there should be some sort of a dialogue and a questionnaire where we can, where your um, your vendor will take a look at your existing equipment uh, and gather data on that. Uh, there will be a site visit to install some instrumentation, um, like I mentioned, DO and power consumption are some of the some of the key ones. And then there's you know right then at that site visit, there's there can be a discussion about initial findings. And then typically the results that should come out of ener any energy audit is um, power consumption trends, pressure trending. That's um, one of the things that we typically monitor, although it's not as important for energy savings, but it is good to see how the head of pressure is reacting during the day. And if your new control system should uh, address that. Um, and then just some other things about temperature trends, power system information, system typing, controls, um, talk about ROI, desired payback. Um, and then uh, every energy audit should have some sort of an executive summary just to summarize all that. So this is a case study that was done um, down in Noonan, Georgia. Um, this, is, this is my region. And in, for this one, this one's going back probably 12 years now. Um, but in this one, they had three existing 20-year-old 100-horsepower multi-stage centrifugal blowers. Their influence was fairly steady, um, you know, if you factor out rain days and things like that. The main motivation for this site to consider an energy on it was to maintain a constant DO throughout the year through the temperature swing from summer to winter. And their quote here was, we're just after a good sound process. Money savings were a bonus to these people. So um, in this example, um, what we did or, or what your vendor would do is you would evaluate the blowers, you would evaluate the DO, the temperature swings, and all that stuff. The results of this um, audit came back and it said, okay, of those three blowers, we're just going to put speed control on one of them. So the motor had to be replaced uh, because it had to be an inverter duty motor because it was 20 years old. Um, at the same time, we rebuilt the blowers uh, with bearing and seal kits. That, for a multi-stage, I mentioned moderate um, uh, maintenance cost. That's the main difference between a, a multi-stage centrifugal and a turbo is that every three to five years, you want to change the bearings and the seals. And then um, uh, a new control system was installed, a VFD with a PLC and it has an HMI on it. And the remaining two blowers uh, operated unthrottled full speed. 
The nice thing here is that the impellers did not have to be changed. One of the um, things that make a multi-stage flexible is that you can change the number of impellers or you can change the design of the impeller. The impellers can be radial, basically just a straight vein, or it can be a backward curve. Those have, that gives you different performance um, from, from the impellers. The radial ones will boost pressure quicker, but not as energy efficiently as a backward curve impeller. In this example, the, the impellers do not have to be changed, but that's something that your energy audit would address. You know, take the blower out, rebuild it, change the impellers, add or subtract impellers. I've, I've had some um, situations where because we used the VFD and we could overspeed the blower, we could actually take an impeller out because now we can get more performance by overspeeding the existing blower. And then um, the other thing that they used this for was uh, overspeeding it for high demand. So the, the, the rain days and or the high inlet temperature days allowed them to overspeed it. So basically the results were that the VFD driven blower is used pretty much for all of their operations. They can bring a second blower online and when they do that, they take the first blower on the VFD and they slow it down to minimum speed, bring on the second blower and then, and then trim with the VFD blower. So here uh, they experienced some good, good savings of about two years um, in this example. And it says here, this has been operating for eight years. Like I said, it's been more like 12 years um, when it comes in, uh, since we've done that um, change out. So I like the, I kind of like their comment here that Noonan made after we did this. They said, before we started this project, the dog was walking us. Now we definitely are walking the dog. So too bad I can't trademark that or use that. But I gave them uh, I gave them credit here <laughs> in the slide. So the last slide here, uh, before I go on, I have an example of a um, of a audit that I'd like to show you. But I did want to point out that any audit that you do um, should point out that there is capital available, um, usually from the electric utilities, um, from your state governments, there's grant money, there's, there's rebates that, that are available. And these are a couple of the sites you can go to. Um, usually whoever you work with um, should be able to help you and point you in the right direction um, on, on where you can look for some of that money that's available. So let me, um, let me pause there. I want to show you an energy audit. Um, Casey, is there any questions I need to address before I move on from this presentation? Not at this point. If folks do have questions, um, feel free to post them in the chat. I'll continue to monitor that, but um, please go on, George. Thank you. Okay. This is a... Uh, this, this was a, an audit that we did. Uh, it's actually an actual audit, but I think we changed the name um, to protect the innocent, so to speak. Um, but it's only, a, it's a pretty simple audit that we do. Um, this, is, this is the table of contents that we have. Here you can see it's any town USA. Uh, but basically every audit has the same information an in, in introduction and executive summary, uh, audit survey, current operational analysis, proposed upgrade, and, and then we also uh, data dump all the raw data. So in this example, um, this site was currently averaging um, about 75,000 uh, kilowatt hours per month. Um, this data was collected between August 19th and 20th, and uh, the blower operation consumes about 68% of the energy at that site. So you can see this one's even greater. The, uh, I mentioned before the studies show anywhere from 50 to 70% of the energy consumption just goes into the blowers. So uh, what we found from this is that um, their set point, their required set point was 2.0 milligram per liter. They were over aerating the full 24 hours per day. And that usually happens because of what I mentioned before. The blowers are oversized at the beginning, could have been 20 years ago. Um, and population growth or loading just wasn't experienced. So they continued to over aerate for, you know, for the, the whole life of those blowers in that plant. 
So the recommendation here in, in the summary, which I'll show you in a minute, was to add VFDs and controllers to stabilize the DO. And basically by doing that, eliminating the over aeration, um, this site is uh, estimated to save about 39% of energy um, just in the aeration blowers. And then here's some of the data. Um, the, um, the August energy bill of $4,500. Um, we estimated that we could save $1,500 a month um, by implementing uh, a VFD and a control system. So here, the estimated annual savings was about $18,000. Of the solution had an $88,000 price. This is just equipment. This doesn't include installation. So there's going to be some contractor costs on top of that. So the, the return on that investment would be 4.75 years. This is what the uh, system looked like before. Um, so this is the power consumption in the blue graph. Um, no, I'm sorry, this is the recommendation. I and mean, this is the power consumption based on the VFD. I think we have a, we have a DO here somewhere. Okay, so here was the, um, the DO curve before. I mentioned that they were over aerating 24 hours a day. We can see they were up around anywhere between five and eight milligrams per liter um, on their DO. And we also monitored header pressure here as well. So this was running around six to seven PSI. And this was the, um, the energy consumption. So with the VFD, um, this was the proposed solution that we ramp the speed uh, and maintain a stable two to three milligram per liter on, on the DO. And then some of the last information that comes with this is basically uh, some of the data that we gathered. gathered. So this plant was, um, was only designed for about two MGD, so fairly small plant. But then we record all the information about the blowers, how they're being controlled, um, even uh, motor starting. So this was across the line. So there was some savings um, with the uh, with the ramp up with the VFD. And then even the um, the uh, basin valves were manual. So if this site wanted to, they could take a look at um, kind of a hybrid control system where not only do they control the speed of the blower, but then they can control, um, they can put positioners on the basin valve and control the air that's going um, to each drop rate. And then this is the system upgrade. So the recommendation here was to replace uh, soft starters with VFDs install DO probes and install a smart VFD controller with the VFD to, to uh, monitor DO. In this example, I don't think we even looked at ambient temperature. Um, temperature would be part of the control system, but because we're looking at DO, that basically is compensating for ambient temperature already because the mass flow of the air is gonna change from summer to winter. So the oxygen content with the basin will also change. So by measuring just DO, we, we kind of incorporate temperature control in, into, that, um, into that control system. Okay, that's a pretty simple um, energy audit, but it gives you an idea. Um, this is the raw data that was collected over the 24 hour period gives you an idea of um, what a simple energy audit could be. So I guess, I guess uh, to, to try to tie this up, um, I had mentioned before, I, I basically focused on multi-state centrifugals here. The, um, some of the newer technologies like the, the PD, uh, PD screw blowers, positive displacement screw blowers, as well as the high speed single impeller centrifugals, whether that be airfoil turbo, mag burn turbo, or integral geared centrifugal. Um, those are typically considered to be the more higher efficient offerings that are out there. So um, you could do an energy audit on, on one of those types of blowers, um, but you probably would get um, less uh, benefit from the results. 
Um, typically, those like the, the turbo blowers, whether it's airfoil or mag bearing, will have a speed controller built into it. Um, that's one of the reasons why they're a little sensitive to outdoor installations or humidity uh, or H2S. So um, some of that functionality is already built into the turbos. Um, the screw blowers can come with or without VFDs as well. So you can, those, those blowers that have the built-in VFDs already have the functionality to, to dial in a more efficient point. The PD load blowers typically run at a, at a single um, speed. Uh, those are usually used for um, backwash or um, some applications where there's less flow. I mentioned they're limited to about 400 horsepower, so um, they don't get into some of the bigger systems. But I specifically focused on multi-stage here because it is the older technology. Um, there are, I mean, over the years, that was the accepted technology. And then over the years, last 15 years, that some of these more efficient blowers are coming on, some of the multi-stages have been replaced with those. Um, so an energy audit might give you reason to pause, um, take a look at where your current system is operating. More importantly, where was it originally designed to run and where is it running now? Um, so you may not have to put in a new technology. Uh, the, the comment I made before was 200, 250 horsepower and higher. The energy consumption of a multi-stage is comparable to some of these single impeller um, high-speed centrifugals. Um, and a lot of the uh, sites too, they know the multi-stage, they can maintain them, they can repair them, they may repair them locally or they may repair them right on site. Um, it's a known quantity. The, the, um, the multi-stage is a little bit, I mean, uh, the high-speed turbos are a little bit of a black box because they come with controls and VFDs, and it's, it's meant to be all packaged together. Um, all the controls um, and speed controls and, and protection is done by the control system with, with the turbo. So um, it doesn't give you as much flexibility. Um, you can't stick a wrench in it and tinker with it. Uh, you're only meant to change the filters and, and um, just ensure that it's still running. Um, so some sites see that as a pro or a con. Uh, that's that's up to you. But um, yeah, that was um, that's the main reason why I focused on the multi-stage here because it is perceived to be less energy efficient, and if uh, the energy audits usually benefit a multi-stage more so than some of the other technology. I have 13 minutes, so I would welcome some questions. I'm sure I flew through that presentation quicker than I would have liked to. I wasn't sure how the timing would work out, but I would like to see what questions you have. If there's some slides I can go back and and um, help explain things a little bit better. All right, thank you, George. Yes, please. So if folks have questions, uh, please post them in the chat box below, and I'll keep an eye on that. Um, before we jump into asking some questions, we'll post a quick survey. So folks who would like are open to having their contact information shared with our presenter today, please uh, answer the survey and let us know and we'll pass that information along. Um, and then once that's done, we'll hop into some questions. I just got that window too, attendee opt-in. I guess I don't need to opt into myself. <laughs> it won't, yeah, they won't let the, the presenters actually answer it even. All right. So if you haven't done so yet, please just take a minute to answer that question. Um, and if folks again do have questions, please post them in the chat box and they can start off with one question. Um, it seemed like George, a lot of the examples you gave of plant upgrades that resulted from these energy audits were uh, installation of VFDs. You kind of touched on this a little bit at the end of the presentation, but do you ever find that the actual blower technology is antiquated and maybe this is specific to multi-stage centrifugal, but can you speak a little bit about um, maybe where alternative blower technologies are more 
appropriate than installations that plants currently have. Sure. Yeah. But, and I didn't, I, you know, you certainly, when you take a look at making an upgrade at your site, you have lots of different options. You have, I, I focus on the multi stage here um, because of the fact that, as I mentioned, some of them are oversized and they go in. And because you can change impellers or subtract or add impellers, they're very configurable to try to match today's performance requirements. So, for somebody that that has an existing blower that doesn't doesn't want to change piping or foundations or anything like that um, it's usually a more economical solution um, rather than um, the new the newer um, technology um, sorry casey your, the second part of your question was comparing that to some of the newer technologies that might be available from an audit Is that um just curious about uh I guess some examples or, or points where you've seen the blower technology installed at a treatment plant isn't appropriate for the process you're using, or um, if it's more than just multi-state centrifugal blowers that you find are antiquated technology for certain processes. Yeah, that, that's that's a that could that could take another hour. Um, usually, so to, to to start at a very high level, um, positive displacement blowers are considered to be constant volume variable pressure. So you park it at a certain speed, it'll give you that flow independent of what the discharge pressure is. A multi-state centrifugal, because if you look at the curve, if you look at this curve, this is considered to be um, variable flow, constant pressure. So you usually size it for a certain point here and then you throttle it for the same pressure um, you have a reduced flow. So that that at a very high level is the first thing to look at. Is, is the blower the right technology? Um, if you look at SBRs where you have very variable, variable head pressures, um, that's where a positive displacement might have been a better solution. So we do have multi-stages that were installed years ago on SBRs, but they need to have um, some of the control system to go with it so that you can change the flow and the pressure based on the new requirement. Um, so that, that's positive displacement versus centrifugal. Um, there are times, let me, I'm trying to think where um, some, there are some examples where um, certain technologies aren't appropriate. Um, when you take a look at a multi-stage, first of all, you know, if you're gonna do an energy audit, and it, and it comes back that you're over aerating and um, you need to change the airflow. The first thing you would look at is, well, can I reconfigure the multi-stage? But if that multi-stage was way oversized to begin with, you know, the multi-stage has a certain diameter of impeller, you just, you can't turn that down low enough to get the reduced flow. So there are examples where we do um, an energy audit and it comes back that that blower was too big, too big, maybe not to begin with, but it's too big now. Now you have to take a look at the solution and say, all right, what are my options? You could pull out the multi-stage, but then you got to put in a smaller one. So now maybe what you would do is take a look and say, okay, what other technologies are available? Um, rather than the multi-stage with, you know, in the belt throttling or speed control, maybe I can take a look at a high speed turbo or something like that. The um, the, the high speed turbos can go anywhere from say 10 horsepower on up to 700 horsepower. So they are meant to cover a wide range of applications that you might see at your plant. Um, similarly, the multi-stage is say 500 CFM on up to 50,000 CFM. When you get into some of the big city plants, um, a lot of times you'll see the old name was Turblex, that's the energy geared centrifugal. So that's very similar to a high-speed turbo. It's a high-speed single impeller, but they do it by gearing up the motor. So um, that usually either a multi-stage centrifugal or an integral geared centrifugal um, would be the better technology for the, for the high flow applications. Um, there's pros and, and cons for both of those that we can talk about, um, but typically that's what we see. In fact, there's even one um, company out called Innovare, which interestingly does an integrally geared single stage centrifugal. But I think 
they li are limited to about 200 horsepower and smaller. So they're meant to fill the smaller void if you want to have a high speed geared um, centrifugal impeller. And then the, the, the turbo of the world would be the, the larger ones, which would go from multi thousand CFM up to 100,000 CFM. Um, so, sorry, that was a long answer, but there, there are different technologies for different applications. PD more suited for variable pressure, um, uh, but PD lobes are usually, of all the technologies out there, the PD lobes are usually the least efficient. But if it's only 20 horsepower and you're running it an hour a day, it's just fine. I mean, for the price um, and for the duty and the energy consumption, that, that blower fits just nicely. All right, thank you. Um, we had two additional questions come through here. Uh, the first one, a, a really interesting question. Do you ever include reductions in head pressure to achieve energy savings? Uh, that uh, typically we can do that, but typically we're not in control of that. So, you know, it, it depends on the basin level. I mean, that's where most of your pressure um, gets used. But one of the things we do in an energy audit is we evaluate the piping system and we evaluate the valve. If we have too many valves, can we reduce pressure because of that? Um, the control system that comes with the with either the VFD or the inlet throttling can compensate for all of that. So I had mentioned during the presentation, all the variables, you could have ambient temperature, you could have DO, you could have higher pressure. You can combine all of these inputs and then have the controller take a look at where it's operating on the curve and, and make adjustments as required. So um, we, we can accommodate for header pressure, um, but usually we're not in control of that. It's usually the downstream piping and the basin um, head level that would dictate whatever pressure it's running at. But I mentioned before, if you go from coarse bubble to fine bubble, that's, that's another change in pressure drop. So all of that stuff, no matter who does your energy audit, all of that stuff should be factored into where the blower is operating and where it should be operating. All right. Um, next question uh, comes from uh, an attendee and they say their understanding is that although turbo blowers are orders of magnitude more efficient than centrifugal units, some are not practically rebuildable. Is that a valid concern, even given the excellent longevity of the turbo style blower? Yeah, there's, I should have written that all down. There's, there's a couple things there. Um, the, the turbo, the single stage turbo, whether it's airfoil, mag bearing, or even integrated geared, is typically a premium cost um, technology, um, but they do provide the energy efficiency. Um, as far as what was the question about maintenance? Or the, I guess ultimately the, the question was that um, they're not practically rebuildable, but uh, they are more efficient and is the, I guess, uh, the mechanical disadvantages of that technology um, a concern, even though they are, uh, the technology has a longevity or a long service life? Yep. Um, yeah, and the service life has been over the last 15 years or so that they've been installed. Um, not too ser serviceable is, is probably a correct term. Um, I had mentioned before that with the turbo, the, the only thing you need to do on the site is to change um, filter elements and, and keep it clean. Um, I don't think I addressed the whole question there. But <laughs> well, may, maybe we'll move. We have about two minutes left here and there's one other question that came through. Um, okay. The last individual, if you would like more details, please, you can follow up with George directly. And again, we'll share the contact information after the presentation. So the last question we have is maybe if you could speak a little bit to mostly open valve control and how that impacts energy efficiency. Um, that's when we get into the MDOX type system. Um, and and um, with, with the mostly open valve, that's where you would be using some feedback based on, on valve position. Um, the other way to do it is to do flow, uh, flow control. Um, but there, there are a lot of different inputs that you can use um, in the control system that you um, provide for the blower. So uh, that's just one piece of it. Um, 
So if you if we if we supply a, a master valve doctors and control system, then if we put positioners on each one of the basin valves, we can control um, the flow um, to each one of the drop pipes. All right, well, we are about at the hour there. George, thank you so much for your time today. Um, again, if there are follow-up questions or folks want to copy the presentation, I believe you can reach out to George directly, um, or if you're interested in uh, organizing an energy audit, please don't hesitate to contact George for that also. So um, again, thank you for your time and everyone, thank you for your attendance. Um, our next presentation is scheduled for May 12th, where we'll have Ingersoll Rand Water presenting. Great. Thank you. Thank you.